Greetings, everyone. My name is Seru Chuma for Financial Insight Zambia, here with Greg Mills, author of the book Rich State, Poor State, Why Some Countries Succeed and Others Fail. Mr. Greg, how are you doing? Very well. Great to be here in Lusaka. Great to have you. Such an honor to finally meet you. So this book is quite interesting. You bring up a lot of points about why some African countries can't really succeed and why you feel some others have succeeded. But what, what really drives you to study this? Because you've traveled for over 20 years in different countries. So what drives you to actually study this continuously? Well, I think most importantly is that Africa is at a critical juncture yet again. Uh, this is a juncture caused by a combination of decades of too low growth plus an enormous demographic change which is underway. Africa is going to double its population over the next 35 years to be over 2.5 billion people by 2050. It's very important that we end the business as usual practices that have got us to the point that our share of global per capita wealth relative to to the world average has gone down from 15, sorry, from 30 to 15 percent. It's halved over the last 60 years. And it's very important that we try and find another way to develop our economy, some new thinking, and borrow ideas from the rest of the world. And since I've been in the very fortunate position of traveling uh, to many countries, to doing field work, to understanding what is good development practice and what is uh, worse development practice uh, in the process, to write some of these ideas down so that we can identify several threads which are applicable to African circumstance. I'm not suggesting that we have to adopt them wholesale, but we can learn certain key lessons. And perhaps the most important lesson of all is the importance of what we do as individuals. That it's not preordained somewhere in the atmosphere about our country's success or failure. It's really largely dependent to what, about what we do and the choices that we make. So you raised a very, very important point, where you say Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, if it grew at the rate of South Korea, could have been twice as wealthy as the rest of the world. Um, you also state the missed opportunity of African growth. And you say Africa is expensive because it's poor, and it's poor because it's expensive. But in that opportunity, you also, in your book, you state there's, don't miss an opportunity to make a good of a good crisis. What do you feel needs to be done to become cheaper and to become richer? Well, I think the, the really good news is there's a lot of upside for Africa. We exist in the same time zone as Europe, for, for, for instance. We share many global languages in Africa, notably French, Portuguese, Portuguese and English, um, which provide us with certain uh, opportunities and advantages. We have this young population, highly energetic, increasing rates of urbanization. More than 50% of people by the turn of this decade will be living in African cities. So these are all, all very positive. This offers economies of scale. It, it's a boost for African agriculture because people in the cities have to be fed uh, and so on. The question is really, and the question has been for some time, is how do we align politics and policy choices with the developmental needs of African people. And our political systems and our political outcomes and the policy choices that are made historically have, have not adjusted uh, um, particularly well in this regard. And we've ended up with a very low growth environment, or, or too low by comparison to our, our demographic gro uh, growth rate. So the challenge for us uh, in Africa is to Firstly, get the political systems in place that are responsive to people's needs. You're not going to get developmental change without the right politics, without a level of representative government. Uh, and particularly, this is about democratic governance, because the history of Africa is really about democracies delivering more historically than, uh, than authoritarian systems. And secondly, you need to learn from the successes and failures of others in terms of what policies work. And there's no rocket science here. I mean, really, you need to make it easy for people to invest their money, to get a rate of return, to invest more, to employ more, to get a, a greater rate of return, and so begins the snowball of development. It becomes a, a self-reinforcing uh, um, philosophy and outcome. Um, what we've tried to do is we've tried to think of, of shortcuts, firstly, import substitution, closing up our markets to the outside world, 
uh, ways that really have proved to be developmental cul-de-sacs. Uh, what we have to do is learn from what Asia did, access the world because it's a much richer place than what Asia was and what Africa is, um, for instance, where you know, 98% of the world economy exists outside of the African continent. We have to access that economy. We have to make it easier for people to move money around. We have to instill the market forces in terms of price setting uh, and not fiddle with uh, pricing because generally it, it's uh, less favorable to the poor in our society. Um, and we just generally have to make it easier for people to do business. Um, that's a cross-cutting uh, endeavor. And that's not, I'm not talking about make it easier for multinational corporations. I'm talking about making it easier for the person selling uh, a pile of tomatoes on the street corner or cooking uh, on the street corner for, for uh, workers in the surrounding areas. It's making it easier for them, where government is there to facilitate business rather than prey upon business and tax business to death. Um, and that's the kind of mindset change. And in this all is a movement from an elite-based system of extraction to a far more inclusive governance model, which puts people rather than the elites at the center. And what we have really done in Africa very badly over the last 60 years is we've, we've been unable to transform the elite-based political economy of the colonial period into a more inclusive political economy of, 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 of the modern world. Uh, and as a result, we see widening wealth divisions and these very low growth rates and an extreme dependence on one or two commodities. And Justin, you mentioned the elites. In your book, you say that the elites have became, have, have become increasingly wealthy, yeah. whereas the population continues to wallow in poverty. And some people advocate that democracy actually creates this poverty. But in your book, you state that democracy creates more opportunities for actually creating development and growth than dictatorships were. So what do you have to say about, from your study of different countries, m different, uh, different uh, systems of governance from dictatorship to democracy? Which one is the right fit, if there is one at all? And what is the best way to get, uh, as you say, it, people managed well in these economies? Well, I'm a South African, so I'm going to err on the side of a democratic outcome. Um, which is what many people fought very long and hard for in South Africa, which has developed, uh, um, which, which has allowed for the development of different opportunities um, compared to where we were 30, 35 years ago. So, but, but I'm not just saying that because I'm a South African. Um, I'm saying it because the developmental experience of Africa is that democracies, or let's term them representative government, um, they develop faster they're less prone to external shocks, in other words, they're less volatile, because they tend to be more diverse in terms of their investment typologies. You know, people will invest in areas other than natural resource extraction. Um, but the problem in Africa is not too much democracy, it's too little democracy. So 93% of Africans currently live under various forms of authoritarianism. The, the inversion here is that 70% of Africans routinely polled, surveyed across Africa, prefer democracy to any other system of government. So do, Africans want democracy, but they're not getting it. And those who are stopping them from getting it are the ones who are saying it doesn't deliver. Well, uh, it doesn't deliver because they ain't getting it. Um, so, you know, democracy brings about more accountable systems of government, uh, um, more responsive government because it shortens the connection between the governed uh, and the government uh, and it, it brings about cleaner government because it's open to greater public scrutiny. Um, it's not a perfect answer. I think Churchill said it's the, you know, it's the least preferable system except for all the others. Um, it's not without its flaws but it's, it's better than many of the experiences that Africa has had. And you know, we went from a period of big man rule in Africa in the 60s, 70s, and the best part of the 80s, to increasing democratization in the 90s and the early 2000s. Now it's swung back to a, a, more, authoritarian, a, a more authoritarian system, in part because of the pressures on government of some of these issues around demography, for instance, which have, which have led to, to uh, uh, many cracks uh, in, in governments, particularly in West Africa and in the Sahel. So 
uh, I think democracy is in retreat across the African continent and the developmental costs of that are fairly severe. Often people say, oh, but what about Southeast Asia? Well, their form of government, and I'm not dictating that it has to be our form of democracy for everybody, um, has worked for them. But what we do know in Africa is that big man rule, usually big man, not big woman, big man rule actually doesn't deliver. It's even worse than the democratic alternative. Uh, there are exceptional circumstances which are sometimes cited, like Rwanda, um, but they are exceptional. Uh, um, and in the case of Rwanda, it's a very small example in comparative population terms and very uh, uh, much dependent on an aid environment around it. So I, I think it's like globalization. Um, people say the problem is globalization, and I agree with them. The problem is globalization, but it's not too much globalization. It's too little. It's not too much democracy. It's too little. Uh, funny you mentioned about big man rule, and we've seen an increasing number of uh, coup d'etats, especially in Western Africa, with Mali as well as with Niger, and uh, I think Chad as well. Burkina, too. yes, Burkina Faso mm -hmm. as well. So at the center of this are resources. We've seen Mali say we're not going to sell our gold anymore. We've seen Chad say our uranium won't go to France anymore. And you raised a very important statistic to say that when Zambia privatized the mines in 1970 or 1980 thereabout, they still produced the same amount as when it was in private hands. So then if resources are at the center of what we feel is our poverty, is the question really about our management of our resources or what should be done for the state to move from poverty, poverty with poverty but what's with mineral rich? Is there a management gap that needs to be filled that is beyond political and goes into the people aspect, skill? Well, two things. One is, is um, uh, what I was saying about Zambia's natural resources is when you privatized in 1971, you produced about 750,000 tons of copper and it gradually went down to about a third of that amount over the next 30 years. And that's a result of poor management, a low copper price in some periods, uh, lack of investment, uh, lack of skills, uh, breakdown in, in uh, regional trade, uh, uh, many factors. But at the center of that was, was the ability to run the mines and the inability to attract inward investment because the government was the principal investor. Um, come your period of privatization, you gradually have built yourselves back up from 250,000 tons to once more the same level as you were back at privatization. So you lost effectively the best part of 30 to 40 years of production. And that figure is probably about $100 billion of, of money. Um, and what you don't want to do is go back to doing that. You, know, you absolutely don't. Governments don't run mines well. Uh, they have to learn to run the proceeds well, if there are proceeds. And whereas your mines were costing you a billion, a million dollars a day in the 1980s, places like Mapani and others are costing you a million dollars a day today uh, because they're not being run at an optimum level. You need specialist mining companies with real knowledge and, and financial clout and wherewithal to be able to turn opportunities into a reality. Now the difficulty with mines, secondly, is that it's hard for governments because governments are reliant on the proceeds from mining through taxation. It's not just corporate taxation, it's also VAT and it's also the, the tax paid by mine workers, of course, which feeds into the economy. But relatively speaking, the, the number of employees directly uh, um, is limited. It's the indirect benefits of a mine which are massively important. It's the indirect benefits which spawned the copper belt. That's what the copper belt came from. It came from privately run mines in the, from the 20s until the 70s. Um, you've seen a relative downturn in the fortunes of the copper belt and slowly it's picked itself back up again. So Zambia's actually gained an enormous amount from the copper mines, maybe not as much as it would have liked to have gained. But in the period that it went from 750,000 tons to 250,000 tons, Chile went from 500,000 tons to nearly 10 times that volume of production because of the inflow of investment. 
and the Chileans have changed their fortunes dramatically. So what, what I believe Zambia has to do is accelerate the development of, of big mines, long-term mining projects, and improve the way in which the linkages exist between what it gains from them in taxation terms and the spend on infrastructure, on health, on education, on a whole bunch of things which allow for that next generation of Zambians to come through. Mines are just a source of wealth for the country. How that sort of, a sort of source of wealth is used is again a choice by government. And I think what we've learned from Zambia's taking on of enormous debt over the last 15 years during the, the period from roughly 2010 until uh, uh, two years ago, uh, from $500 million in 2005 to over $20 billion in, in external debt today and then lots of internal debt to pay civil service salaries and so on, is really about a government not making the difficult choices. It's about a government almost out of control in debt terms, um, which has now had to be brought back into control, which is why you're at the IMF, why you're trying to have repayment terms for all this debt being taken on, at the same time build the productive side of your economy. Um, and that's very tough for any government to reform from a very long period of decline and decay which led you to this position. Um, but mining can play an important part in it. It's not going to employ many people uh, or nearly the number of people who need jobs. What it is going to do is be a catalyst for other industries for a very long period of time, just as it's been a catalyst for 100 years of development in Zambia. And what do you have to say about the place of aid in creating wealth for the state? Um, I think there's a lot of countries in the African continent that have a portion of their budget that is dedicated to aid, to be, financing, to be financed by aid. I think in some countries, like the example of Malawi, you mentioned how they have a budget that's bigger than what they actually produce. So is aid a good component to creating national wealth, or does aid incentivize countries to stay poor? Well, of course, it depends on who you are, because some people take the opinion, Dambisa Boya, for example, the famous Zambian economist, that uh, aid is all, all around bad. I'm not of that view. I think it depends very much how you use it. If I give you money, it doesn't mean you're poor. It, it depends on how you employ that money and what you do with it. Of course, whether you pay me back is a critical part of that, so I'll give you more money in the future. Um, and most aid today is in the form of soft loans, not just simply grants. Um, and I think that money has been used very badly. And I think the current round of, historically, the current round of, of debt negotiations is about debt, not aid, that's been taken on by Zambia, particularly from China, which, you know, if you look out there, it hasn't been used particularly well by the previous government. But that's not the Chinese responsibility. They have a a certain responsibility, but the real responsibility lies with the Zambian government and ultimately the Zambian people who can vote in or vote out a government which they then chose to do based on their record. So I'm not a person who thinks that aid is wholesale bad, but I certainly don't believe that aid is any panacea, it's no magic bullet. It's part of a solution. It can only complement and strengthen government responses and policies. If the policy is bad, it can amplify them into being even worse. If the policy is good, it can provide opportunity to, to make it even better. Uh, that's what the role of aid is. It's, it's like um, a mechanism, and I best, the best analogy, I think, is probably borrowing money from the bank on preferential terms to start a business. You borrow it, but you, you seek to pay it back on as softer terms as possible, longer terms as possible, minimal interest rates, but you use it wisely. Governments always take the opinion somehow that it's somebody else's money and they don't have to use it wisely, they'll spend it on themselves and everything else. And that's why aid, historically, hasn't worked very well as a development tool. It provides the wrong set of incentives for government in terms of the way in which they go about the business of governance and they go about the business of policy. But it's no different to, as I say, to borrowing money from elsewhere. It very much depends on how you use it. And if it's cheap money, relatively speaking, it can be used very effectively. 
And some countries, Vietnam is an example, and there are others in Southeast Asia, have used aid very cleverly, but they had a very clear idea of what they wanted it for. Mostly infrastructure, and quite a lot on health care and education. So, you know, ring fence what you're going to spend it on, and make sure that the infrastructure spend is not excessive, it's not, it's not um, uh, uh, sort of padded with all sorts of uh, corrupt deals, and that, uh, that aid then can become a, a tool for, for more growth. And then what the Vietnamese did, of course, was that they then had more people wanting to provide them with cheaper loans, and they used more aid based on their own needs. So be very careful about identifying what it is that you want, not what the donors want to offer you. Okay, and also on political will. You have say, stated that sometimes, even when there's a champion leader who has a clear idea of what he wants and has the political will to actually do it, as you said, the hard decisions are not made, or perhaps what they are made, there's a lack of trans transmission in the system and over time as well. What do you feel can be done for African states to communicate more effectively and to also have more accountability in their system when transmitting these policies that actually lead to creation of wealth in the country? Well, clearly, African governments need a clear narrative about what it is that they're trying to do. Um, and they need to set up clear objectives and priorities. Uh, the danger is always with governments is they try and do too much, is they set uh, unrealistic uh, visions and expectations as a result uh, set very high in the populace um, and they don't keep things down to the basics. You know, two or three priorities are very clearly communicated uh, with a clear plan for implementation and a focus on the details of implementation. And once you've done them, you move on to another thing. Now, Lee Kuan Yew, the President of Singa Prime Minister sorry, of Singapore for a long period of time, he said we, it was 80% perspiration, 20% inspiration, and we did a few things right. And then when we got them right, we did a few more things, and we deepened and widened them all the time. So the job of a reforming government is to do a few things right. Once you've done them, move on and keep going. On educational policy, right? what do you have to say about governments seeking an intentional education policy and implementing that in the transmission from that educational policy to wealth creation? What more can be done for African countries? Well, I, th I think the, you know, don't, education is a tool. I mean, yes, broad-based education is necessary in terms of, uh, of, of, of an overall education and social awareness, but a greater focus on skills, a greater focus on maths and science, a greater focus on competition uh, in the educational place, uh, um, particularly between girls and boys, uh, and, and raising standards, raising uh, opportunities, and more infusion of private teaching. And not because the private sector has the answer to everything, but because more choice is going to allow for competition and the rising of standards. When, when parents and kids have the choice as to where they put, uh, where they pay their money or whatever the vouchers that they may get from government in this regard, that will in invariably help and drive up educational standards. But the educational pathway is well known from, from Southeast Asia. Um, and particularly from Japan, established in the 19th century and has been copied throughout Southeast Asia. It's about, it's about reforming education, about getting the basics right, about this big focus on maths and science, which of course the Southeast Asians are, are really right up there in terms of world rankings, um, and, and not having a kind of pass one, pass all type uh, system, but in government also reflecting the, the educational environment by having establishing a meritocracy so that the best people end up in government and, 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 and there's rewards for those who work hard and who have talent. Um, uh, and, and that's a very important process so that the, the, the people who, who, who are educated are seen to be rewarded by the commitment and sacrifice that they have made. Mr. Mills, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, Thank very, you much. very much. Thank you very much.